Welcome to Tom Grove, where we talk all things sports, entertainment, fashion, and adventure. Oh my gosh, I've missed you guys, so I feel so happy we're back doing shows. So it might be a little rusty, but bear with me. We're trying out the YouTube podcast at the same time. So anyway, here we go. So being the month of love, I thought it would be awesome to have a former guest come back on who is a fucking rock star when it comes to love and being fearless in love. Gabrielle Stone is the author of the book, Eat, Pray, FML, Fuck My Life. And then now she just has her second book, The Ridiculous Adventures, Misadventures of a Single Girl, um, which has got, obviously got a lot of love from my dog and <laughs> But anyway, so I am so welcome, happy to welcome you to the show, Gabrielle. Thank you so much. It's good to see your beautiful face again. I'm happy to be back. <laughs> you too. I feel like I, I haven't even been able to talk to you since the, the last book, but of course, follow everything on Instagram and follow the journey. So I was so happy when the second book came out to kind of catch up and hear what you've been up to. Yeah, it, it became very clear after I released Eat, Pray, FML that people were demanding a sequel and needed to know what happened after the Europe trip. So it I'm glad that I was finally able to deliver that. <laughs> so for people that, that aren't familiar with the first one, let's catch them up to speed a little bit. Talk about the first book and kind of what led you to going on the journey with the first book. Yeah. So I always say that Eat, Pray, FML kind of happened to me. Um, I was married for almost two years when I found out my husband was having an affair with a 19-year-old for six months. And I filed for divorce, left. Shortly after that, I met a guy and we fell madly in love with each other, had this whirlwind romance of like, meet my family. I'm going to have babies with this person. Like, amazing. Um, and he invited me on a month-long trip to Italy with him. 48 hours before we were getting on the plane, he told me he needed to go by himself. And I was absolutely devastated. This man broke my heart like my ex-husband never could have done. And in that moment, I had a decision to make, and that was either stay at home heartbroken or go travel Europe for a month by myself. So I took a backpack and I did six countries over the span of the month and wrote the book, Eat, Pray, FML. Mm -hmm. And then how hard was it for you to, or what were the thoughts going in when you knew you had to keep going and do the second book? Was it, were you ready to be, because you were so open and vulnerable in the first one. So what kind of feelings did you have going into the second one? The second one was definitely harder for me to write. So Eat, Pray, FML, if you can believe it, is only over the span of three and a half months of my life. So from the time that I found out about the cheating to when I came home from the Europe trip and everything that happened in between is three and a half months. So it was a very like intense period of my life, but it was short. Um, and the ridiculous misadventures of a single girl spans over two years of my life. So I released Eat, Pray, FML in 2019. And that's when I started seeing like, oh, people need to know what happened next. And I was still living that. So I had no idea what the story of the second book looked like, like where it began, where it ended. Um, and it was a lot harder for me to write it because I wasn't writing as it was happening like I was with Eat, Pray, FML. Um, so it was a lot more difficult for me for on a writing stance, but also emotionally, um, it was a lot more difficult of a book to write um, because there are some things in that second book that I'm not necessarily proud of. And there are people in that book that are still very much big parts of my life that I didn't want to hurt. Um, so it was a very different experience for me. Um, I feel like Eat, Pray, FML just kind of flowed out of me and I knew exactly what it was supposed to look like. And I had, as much as like there was heartbreak during it, I had fun doing it. The second one was like, ripping open my soul and like rearranging my insides and was not super pleasant for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can understand because I'm uh, reading it, you know, you're just so vulnerable. You just and real and honest, which I love that all the things that you share. And I was thinking about that, knowing, knowing how the story ends. I think that might be hard for everybody to read and hear those, you know, hear those stories. And this is the first podcast that he, wants to, he wants to do a cameo appearance. Apparently. Hey, as long as it's not my dogs that are being interrupting, like then Ed, we're good. What a cute Beauty. He's of course been napping for the like the last two hours, but you know, but he's awake for this now. He wanted to see that's, 
that's how it happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, as you said, you didn't write this one as it happened and you kind of went back. So did you do it a lot of journaling and, or how do you remember all those conversations or, or how those No. And, happen? and that's why it was tough. I don't journal, um, shocking to a lot of people. Um, but I did, you know, obviously I lived it and there came to be a point in, in my life where I was like, okay, this is probably gonna, if I do write a sequel, like these are the things that are important that will be in it. Um, mm -hmm. So at, at some point I started kind of paying a little bit more attention in that aspect, but it really was written just for memory. There were some, you know, obviously I had text messages and specific conversations that I went back to and referenced some. Um, I have the people that are still in my life. So I was able to talk to them about things. But I also have a very oddly good memory about things that are personal to me. Like if you ask me, you know, big random important facts, like I, I won't remember those. But if you asked me what this specific person said to me in this conversation when we were at this location, I'll be like, oh yeah, let me like give it to you verbatim. Um, so things that are important to me, I, I tend to have like a better memory bank for. But um, it was... It was interesting trying to timeline out two years and be like, okay, what's important to drive this particular story that I'm getting across forward? Because it's yeah. it's your life. So you're like, fuck, everything's important. And then you yeah. send it, you know, I sent my first draft to my editor and she's like, Gabrielle, you're not JK Rowling. Like, what is this? This is so long. <laughs> so Eat, Pray, FML is, I think, 280 pages. And The Ridiculous Misadventures is 100 pages longer than that. Oh. So, and that's after it was cut down considerably. Um, like, it, at one point we were like, is this two books? I mean, is it, are we doing a trilogy here? Yeah. And it just felt like, no, this is one story. You just have to cut some of the bullshit out. Um, so it, it was it was difficult for me for sure, and thank God for my editor because that outside perspective of being able to be like I know you feel like this is important, but it's really not yeah. is invaluable. Well, what I love about your books too, though, is like I, I wouldn't even I mean I, yes, obviously I probably if I look back now and realize oh yeah it, it is that many pages longer, but your writing is so um, just conversational and just flows that you just read through your books like so fast. You just, you know, you just keep going Yay. and I think like your, your chapters are short and you just like keep turning it. So it's really a fun um, read. So I'm so happy to hear that. Thank uh, you. Yeah. So for people, what can they, what are they going to find when they pick up book two now? So the second book is a direct sequel. Eat, Pray, FML ends when I get on the plane to come home from my Europe trip. And The Ridiculous Misadventures of a Single Girl starts when I walk into my house from the airport. So it's literally like people, people are so funny now because the ones that are discovering the first book now are like, oh my God, thank God I can just go right into the sequel. And I'm like, some people had to wait years to get that like second book and they were like I need it now um so it's so funny like seeing the different types of readers that are now discovering it um but the second book from what my readers have said and the response I've gotten from it has a lot more vulnerability in it and there's a lot more um healing in it which is crazy to me because that's when you read Eat Pray FML like that's two words that immediately come to mind. Um, but I think because I, there was, I was going through so much during the times that I was writing about, it really ended up coming through in the story. Like I said, there are things in that book that I'm not proud of. And I remember being like, fuck, if I could only just not write about this one thing, it would be great. Um, but I refused to do that because that's how my readers have come to know me as like raw and vulnerable and authentic and in your face. And I was like, I have to show up that way. Yeah. Um, so I think that the second book is there are ridiculous misadventures. You will get a ton of like, there are different men. There are the same people make, you know, appearances from the first book. Um, there's different characters that people absolutely fall in love with. And, um, and then there's another grand solo adventure. So there's a little bit of everything that you got from the first book and, and some more.
Yeah. What are, um, I love again, like we're talk about, um, some of the things that carried on from the first book, you did the, the thought onions, you know, a lot. And when you break things down and I know like one I really resonate with on this one was you said, you came down to one that said, I don't truly demand my worth. You know, can you kind of explain to people what your thought onion process is and how this one was like an impactful one for you in, in this book? Yeah. So the thought onion is kind of like my way of assessing your thoughts and discovering what's underneath them and what's causing them um, and what you need to heal in order to have different thoughts or reactions in the future. So you look at it like an onion. The first layer is the superficial thought. And that's kind of like your knee jerk reaction that you have immediately before your brain can even catch up as to what's processing and what's going on. Um, And then you take a step back and you get to the authentic thought. And the authentic thought is like the reaction, or sorry, no, the the authentic thought is the emotion that is causing that reaction to happen. So whatever emotion is living in your body, that's the root of why that reaction is coming out in the first place. And then when you take a step back from that, you get to the subconscious thought. And the subconscious thought is really like where the real golden nuggets are. And when you can get to that, it's where like the long stemming trauma is or a a long running subconscious belief that you weren't aware of at first. And when you can get to that level, that's what you need to adjust, be aware of or heal in order to have different thoughts and reactions in the future. And that one in particular, where you, I think that's an, to me, an issue that lots of times a lot of women struggle with, you know, losing the sense of what our worth is, where we like accept things that we shouldn't be accepting in our life and relationships. Yeah. So tell me what your experience with that was. Yeah. I mean, I think so often I would excuse people's behavior. Um, and really specifically in this book, you see a lot of that, um, of me excusing an individual's behavior. and. At the end of the day, if we don't know our worth and demand that and say, okay, we're not going to allow or accept anything that doesn't meet this quality, um, then we're doing a disservice to ourselves because we're telling the universe, okay, yeah, that's cool. I accept that. That's good. This behavior is acceptable for me. And then you're just going to attract more of that. So when people message me and they're like, why do I keep attracting fuck boys? And like, why am I, you know, what are you allowing? Like, what are you telling the universe? Like, yeah, this is cool. Um, so really it's the excuse of the behavior and knowing that an apology is not anything without changed behavior, um, was such a big thing and a big lesson for me to learn. Yeah. Why do you think, cause I'm, I was guilty of it. I wasted years <laughs> on a similar Javier. Um, yeah. and you know, I, I, I look back and I know some of the reasons why I did it. Um, I mean, what, what do you think are some of the reasons why we, we make those choices or we stick with those ones that, you know, just are toxic or narcissistic or just not, not right. I think there's so many reasons. I, I think that for me with my Javier, um, the feelings that I felt in that relationship were so new and so different to me. Um, And at the time I didn't know terms like love bombing and breadcrumbing. And now I do. And I'm like, oh, that's like literally what I was going through. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This makes sense. Um, And because of that, you know, we start to associate those toxic feelings or those toxic dynamics with the term love. And that's not love. That's toxic feelings and toxic dynamics that we have now like associated with this, you know, thing that we have in our head. And for me, it was learning to redefine like, oh, this is actually this is not it. This can't be what everybody's talking about, about this like grand love affair. If all of these things are happening that are making me feel so shitty. So it was like, how do you reprogram your brain to be like, okay, I know that this all felt amazing at one time, but this, this is a, and a plus B is not equaling F over here. Like something is wrong. So we have to like reprogram the brain to be like, okay, what, what do I want in a partner? What is, what are the things that I need? What are the non-negotiables and what makes me feel good? And then sit down and write out the facts of that relationship that like you can't let go of, or like that's narcissistic or that's toxic. And those facts, I guarantee you will not line up with what 
you want, need, deserve. They won't. And when you can look at those facts of the situation and be like, I can't excuse this behavior. I can't argue this behavior. Like these are facts of the situation. Then it's up to you to be like, okay, no, I'm going to demand my worth and walk away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, in this second book, we get to see a lot of you with Tyler and hear a lot about Tyler, who is your unicorn. So on the reverse side of that, let's talk about like finding the unicorns and how, and the journey for you in that book and finding Tyler. Yeah. Well, it's so funny because I always thought that when I was writing this, like, well, people know the ending, like they see my social media, they know I'm with this person. Um, Still till this day, I get people commenting on pictures being like, is this Tyler? Did she end up with the, and I'm like, oh my God, I thought that was public knowledge, but I guess not. Um, Because, you know, people discover the book and they don't know my life as much. So it's more than just the fan base that had been waiting for this second book. They all knew, you know, what the ending was, but a lot of people don't, which is funny to me. But yes, spoiler alert, um, I'm in a happy relationship. And um, (laughs) And for me, it was, it was a lot because I had, again, I had to redefine what I had come to think love was, which was toxic. And I was unknowingly holding away this really good, safe, healthy love because I felt like something was missing. And it was like, nothing's missing. You just don't have that toxic dynamic that you had with that other person that made it feel so all encompassing and overpowering. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge lesson for me. And it, you know, you see in the second book how, how back and forth and in and out I am. And that's one of the things that was really hard for me to write about because I knew that this person that I that I absolutely love was going to have to read about all of this. And he knew everything that was going into the second book, but you know, reading about details of certain things are very different than knowing like, oh, this happened. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was a, it was a journey. And I don't think that many men, many men could be as okay as he was dealing with this whole process with me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's even been since then. You now not only have the books, but you have your own podcast and your yeah. talk. And I heard that he was a guest on there, kind of talking about some of these things you guys went through. Yeah, he just came on um, for his second episode. The first one we kept it kind of more was like in season one, and we kept it more about like you know what's it like to you know read, eat, pray, FML, and be with me now, and you know just kind of like the the details of him and I, and the fact that he's, you know, he knows the characters in Eat, Pray, FML as real people instead of the characters that people read. Um, And then the second one where he just came on um, in season three, we really dug into more like what it takes to have a healthy relationship. um, The things that he and I do to really work at our relationship and maintain that. Um, And it was a really great episode. So many people, it's funny, so many people that follow me you know, read my book and they're like, oh, I I read the second book and I hear your voice like narrating it. And then because there's been so many people that follow me and now know him, they're like, oh my God, I hear him (laughs) and I see him when I read about it. Um, So it's been, it's been really cool to, to see people kind of like embrace our relationship in that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I definitely, um, I hadn't heard his voice until recently before I read the second book, but of course, when I read this one, I constantly hear your voice after you know. Yeah, <laughs> you. yeah it's fun. Fun. Um, well, since it is February, what is some of the advice you guys have or that you have for people, you know, either on a journey like you trying to find their unicorn or in relationships on how to keep the relationship going? So for me, communication is the biggest thing. And it sounds so like, you know, trivial, but it's not like when you can find a partner that you feel safe enough to sit down with and have an honest conversation with, um, it's so invaluable. Um, I don't get scared to talk to my boyfriend about anything. Um, and we have some heavy conversations and it's never like, oh God, how is he going to react? What is he going to say? Um, because we've established that trust with each other to openly communicate. Um, big advocate of therapy, like together, alone, whatever it is. I don't care if nothing's wrong with you, go to therapy. Um, it is like the best gift you can give yourself. And um, whenever something is a little off, like we call our therapist and we do a session about it and we like hammer it out right there. And it's not something that's like lingering that we're trying to figure out, you know, weeks and months down the road. Um, and really the respect 
for each other. You have to have respect for your partner. Um, and that comes in, you know, the regular day-to-day respect, but also respecting their boundaries, respecting their triggers. I feel like if we had first dates and they were like, hi, nice to meet you. I'll order a glass of wine. Can you please let me know what all of your triggers are? (laughs) That would be like the quickest way to start having more healthy relationships. Um, Because when you're with someone that cares about you, that knows your triggers, they're going to protect them and respect that. And so often when we get into these like fights that are really traumatic and toxic situations, it's because people aren't respectful of those. So Mm -hmm. those are the top kind of things that I would suggest for people that are in relationships. Yeah. I think that's, that's great advice. And I know like you talked a lot in the book about, you know, abandonment being like one of yours, because there's so many stuff that we bring through our lives, you know, as children and stay with us that you're, yeah, it's like talking about that stuff right away would, could help a lot of relationships. Yeah, absolutely. And like when I entered into this relationship, there were new triggers that I wasn't, you know, comfortable with the abandonment one I've been like caring for a long time. So I'm like, yo, here's my suitcase. Look at my shit. Um, <laughs> but after the the divorce with my ex-husband, I started realizing that I had a thing with phones. And I know a lot of women will resonate with that. Um, like there's this uncomfortability of like, oh, who's he texting? Or, oh, do I need to look, go through his phone? And it made me feel so grimy because I had never felt those feelings before. And I was really open with him about it and talked with him about it. And because he respects me and understands where that trigger came from, from my ex-husband, he's so laxed about it. Like he will randomly be like, do you want to go through my phone here? Um, Like, Mm -hmm. and just offer it to where I would never want to, but like, it was the fact that it was being offered to me when I'm sitting next to him. If he like can feel my eyes on his phone, he'll always kind of like tilt it towards me a little bit. So like, I can look at it if I want to Mm -hmm. Um, just like things like that, that make, make a big difference because those triggers are real and they come from places. It's not because people are crazy bitches. It's because, you know, they've had that behavior shown to them. So it's really important to find someone that's going to not make you feel crazy for that. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Very common behavior that happens a lot that does make us all feel crazy or feel like you're being the you know, yeah, psychotic one. Yeah. Uh, you also talk a lot in, in, in both your books, you've talked about the, the importance of self-love. What are other things you continue to do for yourself to garner that self-love? Uh, well, right now I've been lacking on it. Um, I, <laughs> as we chatted before we started recording, I'm like, I need a break. Yeah. Um, but really it's, it's doing things for yourself that's going to make you feel love. Like when we're in relationships and you want to make your partner or your, you know, your mother or your brother or like anyone that you have a relationship with feel love, you do things that you know will make them experience love. So when you're trying to practice self-love, you need to do things that are going to make you happy, that are going to make your soul sing. And for me, you know, it it looks different on day to day. Sometimes it's going salsa dancing. Sometimes it's staying at home and like ordering Postmates and watching a TV show and putting my fucking phone down for an hour and having a glass of wine. And sometimes it's booking an Airbnb and leaving for a couple nights and just like getting away. Um, Whatever it's going to be to like give you what you're needing, that is self-love. So many people think, well, okay, it's how I define self-love. So many people think it's like looking in a mirror and being like, I love you, Gabrielle, but like, I feel fucking (laughs) crazy anytime I try and do that. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, that and being kind to yourself in the process, you know, like having compassion with yourself, not beating yourself up mentally and like having these negative thoughts 24 seven and really like staying on top of yourself to a give love to yourself and be like internally in your, your inner dialogue, making mm-hmm. sure that you're, you're talking kindly to yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. Let's switch gears slightly and talk about, um, I mean, one thing I admire is how just on it you are as a female entrepreneur and businesswoman, you know, you've, you've just you. created this whole brand and this world that so many women across the world resonate with. So can you like talk about that process and then in the end kind of give advice on how, you know, things maybe you learned along the way or things that didn't work or how you really grew this from having this idea, like I'm going to write a book to now what you're doing now. 
You know, it's kind of crazy because I can't take credit for the fact that I was like, I'm going to write a book and then build a fucking brand. (laughs) Um, But that is what happened. Mm -hmm. So it really was a natural progression. You know, I I wrote the first book um, and then realized that there was an audience that wanted a second one. So while I began writing the second one, it was really in the pandemic. One of my girlfriends was like, you should start a podcast. Like everyone keeps asking you, I'll produce it. And I was like, the fuck am I going to talk about? Everybody has a podcast. Like, and she convinced me and I was like, all right, you know, maybe a thousand or so of my readers will come over from, you know, book land and start listening. And it just took off. Like there are people that listen to the podcast that still haven't read the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like, I, I, I never thought it would end up funneling in that way. Um, and then from there, you know, it, was like, okay, what can I create next that my community wants? And I, I did this self-love journal that um, I released in December that's really a step-by-step guide of everything that healing encompasses from like grief and heartbreak and love and trust and forgiveness and all the things that you're going to encounter on your healing journey that has like prompts and step-by-step guides still in my voice. Like there's excerpts and stories from me. So like, you know, it's like tough love. You get a little like Gabrielle flavor in there, but um, it's been really incredible to see how that's begun to help people that are, that are working through it. And really, you know, just like what else people are, are needing at the time. Um, and social media, I have such a love hate relationship with it, but it's been the biggest form of like how I've been able to connect with people, how I've been able to like get my book out there. Um, I've sold more books on TikTok than like Mm. you could if you advertised it on TV, like Mm. it's wild. Um, So I've always had this kind of like struggle with, I need to show up on social media because that's how I'm running my business and selling my books, which is in turn helping people heal. Um, But I also want to like move to Thailand and never have a phone again. So it's like this like weird duality that I struggle with inside me on the daily. Um, But it's really, I've really just kind of listened to what people have asked for and been like, okay, what's the need and how can I fill that in an authentic way that can help some people? Mm -hmm. And how has your team, I know we were talking about it a little before we started, has your team grown as far as producing the, the podcast and shows? Yeah, it's it's tough because I get DMs and they're like, is this really Gabrielle or is this her assistant? And I'm like, oh my God, if I had an assistant answering my DMs, like <laughs> the 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 level of like personal information that gets sent to me on a daily basis. Um, I don't have an assistant. Um, I have one producer that kind of like handles the back end stuff on the podcast. Um and recently, like the first two seasons of the podcast, it was just the two of us. Um, and on the third season, we switched to um, YouTube. So now we're at a network, Bespoke TV, that um, that like hosts our, our, our site. Um, and so they shoot the, uh, the episodes in studio and do all the editing on the back end. But as far as like the, the core of it, it's me. Like I have, I'm, I'm in my office looking at it. I have all of our merch in this closet. I have all my books over here. I ship everything out by hand myself, which is insanity at sometimes when we have new merch launches. Um, but it's, you know, like until I can't handle it anymore, which I think we're like approaching, like we're starting to get there. You know, it's, it's my baby. It's my business. And like, I, I do have some control problems and, um, it's like, I, I I need people to do as good of a job as I do for myself. Um, and that's hard to, to let some of that go and trust people. Yeah, sure. How proud of, does it make you feel though, to now look around in your office that you're at and just be like, Oh my gosh, look to look to where you came. I mean, where you got to. Yeah. It's pretty incredible, especially because I started, you know, I was acting and directing, like Mm -hmm. I was not a writer. I like this, the life that I'm currently living in was not in the the plan was not in my brain. Um, and I'm so thankful for it because it's, you know, I, I go on and I do a stupid, you know, video on TikTok that happens to blow up and get millions and millions and millions of views 
that doesn't feel bad to me because I know any person that buys the book, the healing journey they're going to go on and what they're going to get from it. So it, it, it all comes back to if you're promoting, pitching, whatever you're doing, if you're pushing a product, but it's a product that you know and believe in and you know it's going to help people and you know it's doing good in the world, then you're not it doesn't feel like that weird salesman-y vibe. It's, I'm so proud of it. And I'm so blessed to have a career now that is not only supporting me financially, but is fulfilling me so much spiritually. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's that's what you look for, right? That combo. The goal. <laughs> yeah. And you mentioned the acting and directing because you've also, that's a whole nother thing we could talk about. You've done some wonderful projects. Are you still pursuing and working in those genres? Yeah, I'm supposed to be directing a feature film later this year, but we're waiting to see scheduling with all the COVID stuff that continually is happening. Um, but yeah, that's still very much so something I'm interested in doing. Um, and it's it's nice to have different avenues to explore creatively. Um, before the books and everything happened and I was only acting, it was like book a job, book a job, book a job, or you're not paying your rent. Mm-hmm. And now I'm very fortunate to be able to turn down jobs that come in that I'm like, I don't resonate with this role or that's not something I want to do where before I would just have to take it for a paycheck. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's really, it's great to have different avenues now that I can explore creatively. Yeah. Something else I love about the book, first number one and number two, are your talks about your solo traveling. Because I think that is just amazing that you do that. It's I've, I've done some solo traveling, and not to your extent at all. And I know that it's it can be hard, and it can be you know difficult to make that choice. So I'd love to hear about um, some of the trips that you did in this book for the for our audience. Yeah. So the second book and solo trip I took by choice, <laughs> um, and because the first the the Europe trip was life-changing. Um, it, it taught me so much about myself. I think everyone should go solo travel once in their life if they can, um, because it really changes you as a person and it's absolutely magical. So I knew right when I came home, I needed to go and do another trip and Southeast Asia was very high on my list. So I knew that I was flying into Thailand or sorry, I knew that I was flying in to Vietnam and flying home from Bali. Um, That was like where my ticket was and it was a full month. So I flew into Vietnam. I knew what hostel I was staying at and that was literally all I had booked Mm -hmm. Um, because it really allows you to just go with the flow and meet people and get invited places or like if something's not feeling right. So I was in Vietnam for like a week and a half and I was just like, my heart wasn't settling the way I needed it to and I was solo. So I was like, bing, book a ticket to Thailand. Great. Uh, was never supposed to be in Thailand. Went to this little town called Pai. It was so magical. I talk about it on a weekly basis. I dream about it on a monthly basis. Um, I cannot wait to go back. And it was really where a lot of my healing happened on that trip. And it was, I, I met so many incredible people there and it really just like healed my soul in a lot of ways. And then I ended up going to Bali because I, the one thing I did have booked there um, was a silent retreat that I went and did. And because my ticket home was there from Bali. So I had to get to Bali at some point, um, but it ended up being a really incredible trip. So I did those three countries and it was, it was magical. Yeah. Tell me about the monkey experience. Oh, girl. PTSD, (laughs) PTSD. Um, My FMLers, as they call themselves, um, actually sent me a gift, um, like a big gift box with like snacks and like wine and like all this like really cute stuff um, for over the holidays. And there were two stuffed monkeys in there, (laughs) like as a joke. Um, So I was in Bali and there's like the monkey forest there and everybody talks about it. It's big fucking tourist attraction, which I think is bullshit. And you will soon hear why. Um, And so I go and I was already kind of, maybe they could smell my fear. I don't know. But I walked in and was like a little nervous. I love monkeys. I think they're cute and adorable. And, you know, people like they crawl on you. Sometimes people take selfies with them. Like it's it's a thing in Bali. 
And so we, I walk in and I'm like looking around at all these monkeys and I'm like, okay, all right. It's, it's all right. We're, we're cool. We're cool. And they have some like workers there that, you know, are like keeping an eye on things. So I go and sit down on a bench where it's probably like a six foot bench and there was a monkey on the other end. I sit down, take my backpack off. And the second I sat down, this monkey like whips its head over (laughs) at me. And like, I was like, oh God. Okay. So I I was like, just stay still. It's going to, he's going to climb on you like a tree and you're going to like, you know, have a little abu friend and it's going to be fucking awesome. Um, That's not what happened. So he (laughs) climbs, he crawls over to me rather quickly and puts his little monkey paws on my forearm. And I'm like, oh my God, dude, what up? And he fucking bites me. (laughs) Like just takes a full on bite out of my forearm and then runs away. And it wasn't even that it was like super painful. I think I was just in shock at the moment. Like this motherfucker just bit me. Like he, he really like looked over and said, that's, that's it. She's the one. Um, and I started bleeding <laughs> and I, I get taken by one of the workers in and they're like, don't worry. Like the, the monkeys in this part of Bali aren't the ones with rabies. You're fine. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So he like bandages it up and I like go along my way, post about it on Instagram. And someone's like, um, you need to go to the ER right now. And I'm like, no, no, no. The guy said it was fine. They're like, no, you need to go to the ER right now. Thank <laughs> God for travel insurance. Cause this whole ordeal was like $3,000. So I, go to the ER and they're like, yeah, no, that's kind of like what they tell you to like cover their ass. Like you need to get some shots. So I ended up having to get, I I always say this wrong. And I remember when I had to record the audio book, I was like, that's never how I've said it in the million times that I've read it and written it in this book. Emoglobulin, I think it's pronounced. Um, But it's, it's a shot that you have to administer directly into the open wound, which is Ugh, horrible. And then I had to get three rounds of rabies shots, two in Bali, and then one when I came back in the States. Um, and it ended up being a category three bites out of three categories. Wow. So it was an experience. Um, I then took a hike a couple days later in Bali and there were monkeys up there and I was like, not there for it. I was not like, no. Yet. Immediate PTSD. Immediately. No. <laughs> no more like these cute little monkeys. Huh? No, no. Um, on another note, maybe hopefully a little more peaceful. Tell us more about the silent retreat. Yeah. The silent retreat was interesting because I've never done something like that before in my life. And, you know, there's meditation and yoga and they cook everything, um, on site from like the vegetables that they grow in the ground. So like there's this gorgeous spread of food three times a day and you really like you do nothing. Like I've never done nothing. Um, so it was like, yeah, I would take a yoga class or a meditation in the morning. And then it was like, and then what? (laughs) So I would, I would read into an entire book and I would take three naps because my body wanted to, and I was actually letting it. And it was really interesting to not, it was, I I really like went hardcore. I was like, I'm not going to take my headphones. I'm not going to have my phone. Like I I was silent. I was not talking to people for three days and I was not having any like technology or communication with people. And I think the biggest thing that it taught me was how much less we need than we think we do. Um, Like the room that I was staying in was three walls and then the fourth wall was the jungle um, and a little tiny single bed with a little canopy over it for, you know, any mosquitoes. And it was very simple. Um, there was a no trash on site policy. So like, you can't like bring a little tube of toothpaste and then throw it out. Like you have to take the tube back with you. Mm -hmm. Um, you get your own set of dishes and you're responsible for cleaning those and putting them back in your little space. Like it was very simplistic and so fulfilling at the same time. And I think it really just enforced how much extra stuff we feel we need in our day-to-day lives. Um, But it also made me realize how much I value connection and communication and having conversations with people. Um, So it was, it was an interesting journey in a lot, but people go for two weeks. Like I I left after three days and was like, I need to speak to someone. (laughs) Um, Like I can't imagine doing it for that much longer, but there was some really great gifts that came from it as well. Was there a process of like 
shutting your brain down and feeling it calm. Like, you know, I feel like we have so much, so many thoughts going through our head all the time that I would think that it may take a minute to like, okay, get those out. Just be calm. Totally. That's like why I can't sleep most nights um, is my, yeah. my brain won't shut the fuck up. Um, uh, yeah, I think the meditation helped for sure. Um, there was a labyrinth on site where if people don't know what that is, it's basically like rocks that are in a maze like formation and you kind of like very intentionally walk through it until you get to the center and then walk back out. Um, and you know, I would, I would read and I would write. Um, and it was really just after a while, like after the first day, the thoughts kind of are like, Oh, all right, we're having quiet time. So like they'll come up, but it's not as crazy as what you would experience in normal day to day when you're like at the end of the day, trying to shut your brain off. It's kind of like you turn the engine off and it's revving for a little bit. And then it Mm -hmm. like finally kind of calms down. (laughs) Yeah, totally. What tips do you have for people doing solo trips or just trips like you did? Don't over plan. Um, Like I said, for Southeast Asia, I only had, okay, I'm going to Vietnam and this is the hostel that I'm staying at for the first three nights. Um, And that allowed me to change what I wanted to do often. You know, it was like, oh, we're going to go on a day trip here. Oh, we're going to, you know, go down to the South for a little bit. Um, And you meet so many people that you want that kind of like flexibility. Um, On my Eat, Pray, FML trip, when I was in Amsterdam, I met someone and they were like, oh, you know, like I'm going to Mykonos in a couple of weeks and I have an, an extra space in my room. Do you want to come meet me? Mykonos had never been on my list. Like that was like not even in the realm of where I thought I was going to go. And I went and it was incredible. And it was only because I didn't have stuff booked yeah. that I had to cancel or wasn't like locked into things. So it gives you this freedom and it's so easy to travel around the two, at least like Europe and Asia, the two places I've been to, um, where you can just be like, I'm going to get on a train and go to Paris tomorrow. You know, like, it's not like you need to plan ahead. There's always going to be an Airbnb. There's always going to be a room at a hostel. Um, like it's very easy and accessible Mm -hmm. to book things last minute. And there's some freedom in that, you know, it's really, it it gives you this sense of like, what's next. That's really exciting. And what about being open to new experiences like possibly mushrooms? Right, like that. <laughs> um, yes, I did in fact do a, do a little bit of mushrooms on my Asia adventure. Um, that still I think is one of my favorite chapters. Like when I was recording the audiobook and we got to there, like I was cackling out loud. It took me a while to get through it. Um, and I'm still very good friends with the girl, um, Nina is her name <laughs> in the book, um, who, who did them with me. and it's just, yeah. You know, like you, sometimes you're traveling and you just got to say yes to shit and be like, you know, wouldn't be doing this back home, but like, let's go. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's an important part of travel, right? And the new experiences, you got to experience it all. (laughs) Yeah. It's, you know, and there's always going to be things that come up on your travels internally that you are trying to work through. And you know, sometimes some psychedelic assistance is, uh, helps you work through it. You know, (laughs) to each their own. Exactly. No judgment. (laughs) All right. So what is next for you? You know, right now it's so funny because I do so many interviews and podcast stuff where everyone's like, what's next. And I, I always feel this like pressure to be like this, this, this. And there are those things, like there are things that you know, I'm working on that's like coming down the pipeline, but really right now I'm being very mindful of trying to enjoy everything that's happening. Like I wrote two books. They're being like hundreds and hundreds of copies are being sold daily. Um, I have a podcast that people are either listening to weekly or discovering now and binging. Um, I just like released this journal. So I'm really like letting myself enjoy the fruits of my labor, I guess mm-hmm. you can put it. Um, and it's been really nice to just be like, you know, I know there's some new big things that are going to come, um, but it's really great to be able to sit back and be like, look at all the stuff that I've done over the past two years and just kind of appreciate that and mm-hmm. like revel in that for a little yeah. bit. 
Yeah, I think you need to enjoy too. Um, Tyler, you know, you're, 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 yes. you're, you found your happy ending. We'll all be happy for you and want that happy ending. Maybe later on we'll get like a FMML, like a fuck my married life. And you can talk oh my about God, I married love adventures it. or something. Who knows? But yeah, you deserve to just enjoy things. You've been doing so much and you know, oh, sharing I love so that. much with all of us. It's so funny that when people finish the second book, they're like, okay, I'm ready for book three. I'm like, guys, do you want my life to blow up again? Cause that's what have to happen. Like for me to do, I think I eventually will do a third one. It won't be like the third of like a trilogy. It'll be a very different kind of book. Um, but right now I still have massive writing hangover from that second one that really kicked my ass. Um, but you know, we're, we're, it's, I'm sure it's down the pipeline. I got to live a little bit more life first. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, enjoy. Well, tell everybody where they can get your book, how they can follow your podcast, every way they can keep up with you. All the things. So the books are exclusively on Amazon or signed by me on my website. The website is eachpreyfml.com. That's also where you can shop all of our merch and get the uh, self-love healing journals. Um, the books are Eat, Pray, FML and The Ridiculous Misadventures of a Single Girl. They are available in paperback, hardcover, ebook, and audiobook, which I narrate both of. And the podcast is called FML Talk. It airs every Wednesday wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube at youtube.com slash fml talk love it guys check it out if you haven't read the books you must do so now and like she said now that you have two it'll be two quick reads all all the way through go for it they're just so fun and you're so fun and i appreciate you taking the time to talk with me thanks girl so yeah thank you so good so good to see you again so i appreciate (laughs) you having me back on of course, thanks. And thank all you guys for listening, saying you can follow us on TomGirl.tv, our YouTube channel, Spotify, iTunes, wherever you get your podcast. And we're finally back. I'm going to have some more shows coming out for you. So we'll see you soon. Bye.